his name forever. Amen, church? And listen, that is our prayer, that God would have his way in this place. Amen? In fact, will you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we pray, that's our heart's cry, that your name be lifted up, that you would have your way in this place into our hearts, that our bold declaration, our bold pro proclamation is that your way is better. Your thoughts are higher than our way. Our thoughts, your ways are better than our ways. Far above what we have planned here in this place, God, may you have your way. And our prayer today is that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. Well, hey, welcome everyone to Christ Fellowship. My name is Van, I'm one of the pastors here. So glad that you're here. In fact, I wanna welcome all of our campuses all across Miami-Dade, as well as our online campus. Hey, we've been uh, journeying through the book of Mark. We're actually continuing our series called Living the Good Life. And we're nearing the end to the series, nearing the end of the Gospel of Mark. And today we're gonna to look at the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 15 beginning in verse 33. If you have the Christ Fellowship app, you can follow along as I read there as well. So Mark chapter 15, beginning in verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eloi, Lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jump down to verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and he breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man is the Son of God. God bless the reading of his word. You may have a seat right where you're at. Well, I was thinking earlier this week that life is a series of boundaries, limitation, and restricted access. And in fact, if you think about it, in the everyday stuff of life, this seems to be the case. There's restrictions, is it not? In fact, that when I th thought about that, even in my own cell phone, I am restricted access. It isn't until I punch a few codes or look at the phone so it can authenticate my identity. Until then, my phone is restricted. It's disabled. I don't have access. In fact, when my son was about one years old, he, he got to grab a hold of my phone and he punched in the wrong code sequentially over and over again to the point that my phone was disabled. It was locked for five minutes. Has that ever happened to anyone here? Yeah, it got locked in. And listen, no matter how bad your case was or my case, it does not compare to one dad who his toddler son disabled his phone. In fact, we have a picture of how long his iPad is disabled for 25,536,442 minutes. So if you're doing the math, that's 48 years that at the time that this was disabled, uh, that it would take up to the year 2067 for him to have access, which ironically enough was about the time that he was grounded as well, 2067. <laughs> but the reality is that when we don't have access to things, isn't it true, it can feel kind of awkward, it can kind of feel kind of uh, weird, it can kind of feel humiliating and kind of embarrassing, right? And maybe you know how this feels, right? Maybe for you, that you, you were invited by some friends, right, to be a part of this party or this invitation, and everyone got the invite, but you did not get access because you didn't have an inv invitation. Has it ever felt that way? Maybe for you, you kind of feel like this person right now, Right? He's trying to get access, but it, access is denied. And so yes, it could feel awkward, it could feel humiliating, but the reality is, doesn't it make all the more, the times that when we are granted access, all the more meaningful, isn't it not? And when we are granted access to that thing or that place or that person, it brings about meaning in our lives even far beyond if we deserved it or we even earned it. In fact, my wife and I, our small groups uh, invited us to watch a football game at the Hard Rock Stadium. 
and we were giving kind of exclusive access to this place. We were not watching it from the stadium like where everyone else watched it, where most people watch it. We got access to a theater room. Have you ever seen one of these? It's an air conditioner. You had the perfect view, big screen TV, concierge service, and your whole party there is to watch it. And we got access to that. We were given two tickets, a VIP ticket as well as a VIP parking. I mean, the whole experience just screamed out, exclusive. And, and we, as we entered into this place, the stadium, we would file, filed in line just like everyone else trying to find parking. But when we showed our VIP parking, they made a way, an access for us to escape the line to a RSVP parking, which ironically enough has some guy's name on it, right? It was his reserved parking. And as we walked out of our cars and into the stadium, it was loud, a sea of fans everywhere. But the moment that we got to our floor, the moment that we got to our hallway, suddenly the, the crowd began to die down because it was only for those who had access to that place. And so we punched in our code to unlock our door, and there is our party. And it was such a great experience. It was such a memorable moment. We had access like never before. In fact, my greatest access was the access to the buffet that they had offered, which was great. You know, I thought to myself, when I recall that story, I thought to myself, man, this is what it feels like to live the good life. Amen? And, and the, the reality is, is that the reality is that when it comes to kind of our story, our teaching today, isn't it true? Because the same can be said about our spiritual life, can it not? That the, in the everyday stuff of life, when we get access to something or to someone or to some opportunity or some privilege, it brings about joy and happiness into life. And can I tell you in a much bigger way that God has given us access? That God has given us access. And listen, this kind of access means the world. In fact, my big takeaway for us today is simply this. We have the good life when we have access to God. We have the good life, experience the good life when we have access to God. In fact, what I would even simply say, listen, in this world, you can have all the access and all the exclusive things in your life, but if you don't have access to God, it is not worth it. And so we have been given this access by God. Now the question is, what access? And how, how did I get this access? That is a more important question, right? How did I get this access? How is it possible that I have this access? Well, we're gonna find out as we jump back into Mark chapter 15 at the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, context is important here because we are jumping near the end of the story. And what we see is Jesus' last hour on this earth, dying on the cross. And so context is important for us to understand how did we get access to God? So if you're taking notes, put this down as point number one. Context is important. Point number one, access was granted from the beginning. And at the beginning, God created us with, in harmony with him. That at the beginning, God created Adam and Eve with perfect relationship, perfect fellowship. Nothing hindered that. That we were connected with God. That God created us to reflect God's goodness in all of creation. And so the best way I can possibly demonstrate that is to a toy that maybe some of you guys are familiar with called Thomas the Train. So in the beginning, God created us. God created us with access, we were connected to God. Life as God intended it to be. There was no barrier, there was no hindrance, that we were to walk with God on earth to reflect the goodness of our God. But then the story turned south. Because the moment that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the moment they rebel against God, sin enters into this world, and this once world that we had granted access no longer existed. See, Adam and Eve, they sin, and sin and death enter in the world, so we had access, we were granted access from the beginning, but write this down as point number two, but sin denies access to God. And all of a sudden, harmony has been ruptured that we were no longer connected to God. 
We turned our backs against Adam and Eve. Because of that, the consequences was simply this. They were banished from the presence of God. Their curse and there was the, the, the conclusion was that you are no longer part or have access to the very presence of God. In fact, here is in Genesis chapter 3, here's what we see. He, that is God, drove out the man, Adam and Eve. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim. Now, a cherubim was this angelic being with the sole function in Genesis chapter 3, along with a flaming sword, turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. In other words, they were to guard the entrance. This cherubim was to guard the access to God. That whenever they saw the cherubim, whenever they saw the flaming sword, it was a simple reminder that when it comes to the presence of God, access has been denied. And can I tell you, this isn't just an Adam and Eve problem. This is an us problem. Because of sin, it caused a separation to access to God. In fact, Isaiah 59 puts it this way. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. And so if I can go back to this illustration, in the beginning, God created us with harmony, nothing separated, but we, because of sin, turned our backs on God, causing this separation. And because of sin, no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we try to draw near to God, because of sin, God does not hear us. He turns his face. And then no matter how God desires to draw near to us, because light has come into the world, darkness cannot stand it. And so what does God do? Does God just simply abandon his creation? Because sin is a serious thing. It's a big deal. It's what separates us from God. So what the Bible says, God provides a provision. That in the Old Testament, this provision came in a form of the tabernacle, which simply means the dwelling of God. That God, despite sinful humanity, made his dwelling with the nation of Israel. And through that, the sacrificial system made way for the sacrifices to atone for the sins. But however nice and however great and however gracious this provision was, it was not enough and it was not sufficient. See, this this provision got the opportunity for people to get close to God, but never enter into the presence because access was still denied. Now, the tabernacle soon became the temple, and then at the time of Jesus, we see the temple being built and put together where the sacrifices was. And at the time of Jesus, this is actually a picture of what the temple would have looked like. It's a rendition because the temple does not exist anymore at that very particular place, but it's this beautiful, ornate thing. And everything about this temple says that God dwells there But there are series of courts that remind you that access is denied. You can get close, but access is still denied. So if you were a Gentile, like most of us there, if you were there at that moment, you were able to enter. In fact, we have an aerial view of what this might look like. And the outer courts was called the court of Gentiles where if you weren't a Jew, this is as far as you go. You could not go beyond this point. Access was denied. Now, if you were a Jew and you were a woman, you can go beyond the court of Gentiles to the court of women, but you could not go any further because access is denied. Now, if you were a Jew and you were a male, you can go beyond the court of women to the court of Israel, but that as far as you can go. Because access is denied. Now, if you were the lucky one and you were a Jewish male priest, you can be a part of the court of priests where sacrifices were made. But that is as far as you can go because access is denied. Now, at the heart of the temple is what's known as the holy place. It's a place where only a few priests can enter and they can get really close to the presence of God. And at the heart of the temple was this blue area called the Holy of Holies. You know why this was so important? Because in the Holy of Holies 
What you found there was the Ark of the Covenant, which was a symbol, a display of where God's dwelling was, his presence. And the Ark right there had this golden kind of uh, uh, covering on top that covered the Ark, that sealed the Ark, the presence of God, which is known as the mercy seat. And do you want to know what's on top of the mercy seat? Is this beautiful, golden, ornate cherubim. You remember cherubims? In Genesis 3, that guarded the presence of God. It was this reminder whenever they saw the Ark of the Covenant that God dwells here, but we do not have access to his presence. In fact, what divided the holy place and the Ark of the Covenant, the very presence of God, was this giant curtain, this ornate curtain, 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, four inches thick, And it was a constant reminder, hey, you can get close to the presence of God, but access is denied. No one had the opportunity to enter into the Holy of Holies except for one person, the high priest. And he was only allowed there one day of the year on the Day of Atonement, to offer sacrifice, to sprinkle blood, so that the sacrifice, the atonement for sin of the nation of Israel. Now listen, this was terrifying, all right? Because how is it that a holy God can allow sinful men into the very presence of God? In fact, the whole nation of Israel was in awe because if he managed to make this happen and it was successful, well, that means that our sins are atoned for. And this was a very nerve-wracking moment. This was a very scary moment. This is kind of a very charged moment. Because if the the priest, the high priest, does not, is not successful, God would strike him dead. In fact, they would fasten a a, a bells around him so that they would hear that that, that there's commotion going on beyond the curtain. And the moment that that the bells no longer jiggled or heard the sound, what they thought in their mind is, oh no, he is dead. And so what they did was they tied a rope around his leg. So in the moment that God strikes him dead, that they could not go inside beyond the curtain to rescue him. They would just simply pull him out and drag him out there. Can you just imagine that? Imagine you're one of the priests on the other side, and they told you, hey, the high priest is dead, and we have to drag him out. I often wonder what they must have thought of. They must have thought, man, what a drag. Okay, that's a bad joke. That's a, that's a dad joke for you, a uh, bad joke. Yeah, some of you will get that later. But it was a constant reminding, reminding that you could get close, but you could not enter in. It was this reminder. I mean, can you imagine the moment that the priest walks out of that curtain and all of a sudden a sigh of relief? He made it. Forgiveness of sin, the atonement of sin is done with. It's kind of that feeling that husbands you get, right? On, on a Saturday morning, after you go through the honey-do list, right, that your, your wife gives you. You know what a honey-do list is, right? It's all these to-do lists that your wife tells you. It's called, the reason why I call it honey-do list is because it's saying, honey, do this, honey, do that, honey, do this, honey, do that. And you have a list, and on Saturday afternoon, as you are going through the list, you know that feeling you get of accomplishment? You don't know because it never happens because you're always at another thing out there for them to do. And can I tell you, this is the feeling, the instant feeling that the nation of Israel had. Yes, our sins are atoned for, but tomorrow we'll sin and we will mess up and we will fall short and on and on again, year after year after year, a sacrifice had to be made so they can get so close, but they could never enter in. And then there are these rumors, these are these prophecies in the Old Testament of a greater provision that is to come. That would end the sacrificial system. A greater high priest who had the better sacrifice once and for all. And the provision is that God put on flesh and dwelt among us, John 1 says. In other words, he tabernacled among us. That when John the Baptist saw Jesus from a distance at the beginning of his ministry, the John, John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, here's the thing. 
Not only was Jesus the greater high priest, not only Jesus would perform the greater and sufficient and perfect sacrifice, but get this, and don't miss this out, Jesus would be the greatest sacrifice. He would be the one slain for the forgiveness of sins. And so Mark, in Mark chapter 15, makes this kind of connection that maybe it might be obscure to us. He says this, when it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Now, what's the significance of that? Why would he put this time frame? Because what happened at the very last breath of Jesus was about three in the afternoon in the hill called Golgotha, about a mile away from Herod's temple, and at 3 p.m., the priests would offer sacrifices. And he's making this connection. There is a greater sacrifice just a mile away, the perfect, perfect sacrifice that would be sufficient. And so Jesus, in his greatest hour, experienced the horror of horrors by dying on the cross, bearing the weight of our sins. Do you remember last week, Pastor Al gave a great message on Jesus and prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane? See, it was at that garden where Jesus was so filled with agony that he collapsed on the floor and he pleaded to his father, if there's any way, please take this cup of suffering. And he was so filled with agony and he was so filled with pain that the Bible says that he literally sweated drops of blood. As if Jesus saw what was to come, as if Jesus knew what were the things. And yes, as horrific as it was, the, the, the arrest, the betrayal, the beating, the mocking, the crucifixion, that did not pale in comparison to what the horror of horrors he's about to face. And that is taking on the sins of the world. And it's at that moment as Paul put it this way, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. As if Paul was saying, Jesus did not only taste sin, but he who knew no sin became sin, poured on the judgment of God on our behalf, the wrath of God on our behalf. And it was at that moment that Jesus could not bear the sight that God would, uh, the Father would reject him, the Father would look away, and he would bear the sins, the very thing that separates us from God. So the point where Jesus collapsed, and in Luke's gospel, the Bible says that God sends an angel and appear to Jesus and strengthen him. I often wondered, how did this angel strengthen Jesus in this moment of agony in the garden? What did he whisper in his ear? What did the angel show and remind Jesus? Was, was it that, hey, if you do this, Jesus, that you would get the approval of the Father? in perfect obedience? Well, no. You know why? Because Jesus already had the approval of God his Father. You remember in the baptism of Jesus, even before Jesus started his ministry, there was a voice from heaven, from the Father to the Son, saying, this is my Son, who, in whom I am well pleased. He got the approval. So it wasn't that. What did the angels show him? Was it, was it uh, when you do this, Jesus, then you will have all authority and dominion of all creation? Was that it? The answer is clearly no, because Jesus already had that. In fact, what Paul says in Colossians is that Jesus is the one who's holding the world together. That means that when Jesus was on the cross, when he had to pull himself up on the cross with nails put into his body just to breathe his next breath, he was controlling the universe. No one takes Jesus' life away from him. He freely gives it away. So what was it? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us what it was. We, we don't know what happened. We don't know what the angels show to strengthen Jesus. But I feel like there's a, I think the writer of Hebrew gives us a hint on what actually happened. And it could, I could be wrong, but that's just what I believe. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says this, for the joy set before him. Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame. As if, if the angel whispered to Jesus and said, hey, there's joy beyond the cross. Now, what joy? 
What was that joy? What was the joy that was set before him? You know what the joy is? It's you. What did Jesus not have on this side of the cross that he would, by going to the cross, have obtained on this side of the cross? It was not the approval of the Father. It was not dominion of the universe. It was you and your and my redemption. It was the way that God can make access to God, to the death and life and the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, here's what 1 Peter says. This is what Peter says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to That was the joy that was set before him. And so if, if the, at the beginning we had access granted to us, but sin is the one that denies access, here's point number three for us today. Point number three, Jesus then reopens a path to access God. Jesus now reopens a path to access God. And the next set of verses will explain to us how and what happened. Mark chapter 15, he says this. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means my God, my God. And here's a key word, why? Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Now, what's going on in this scene? What's happening here? Well, there's several different interpretations depending on how, and I think all of them are right. One, I think Jesus is fulfilling prophecy. Right there, he's actually quoting Psalm 22, a psalm of David. And another popular view is that he actually, and it's so true, he actually has been forsaken by the Father. That when Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin, God looked away. And in one commentator said the reason why it was dark at noon is because God could not see the wrath that was being poured on his son. But I think another interpretation of this, why have you forsaken me, brings weight, especially to our teaching, to access to God. See, in Hebrew, ironically enough, this isn't translated. It's actually left in Aramaic. It's not translated uh, to Greek and to our modern English language. It's actually kept its actual Hebrew. And in Hebrew, this word why could be used in two ways, right? It could be used, uh, the word using medua, and medua is the, is, is the word why, but its purpose of medua is always looking backwards. And medua, it looks for an explanation of the event. And maybe for you, you've experienced pain and hardship in your life, and you ask a medua question. Why is this happening to me? I need to find explanation. I need to find understanding of what, what's going on here. Now, there's another word in Hebrew that uses the word in the interrogative in our English word called why, and that is lemma. Now, lemma, unlike medua, does not look backward. It actually looks forward in the event and seeks an explanation or uh, seeks a demonstration of the event. And so it could simply be put this way, that this why question is not so much why is this happening to me, but rather would you show them why? This is happening to me. That on the cross, Jesus didn't cry, my God, my God, Medua, what's going on? Why am I being forsaken? That on the cross, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, Lemma, would you show them why I am being forsaken? And at that very moment, God shows them why. Because in verse 38, it reads this. Verse 38, then the curtain of the temple was torn. The curtain of the temple was torn. When Jesus cried out in a loud voice and gave up his last breath, the curtain of the temple was torn, which then symbolizes now we have access to God. The message of access denied because of the sacrifice of Jesus is now the message of access granted. Jesus reopens the way of our path to God. Amen? 
Now, there's an interesting note here, what we see in the rest of verse 38. In fact, actually, Hebrews uh, 10 puts it this way. By, sorry, go back, go back to Hebrews, sorry. Therefore brothers, and, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. Next. By the new and living way. He reopens a way that has opened for us through what? The curtain. That is through his flesh. And in verse 38 of Matthew 15, it gives us interesting detail. And the curtain of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. Now, what's going on here? From top to, what's happening? Well, this 60-foot high curtain, 30-foot wide curtain, 4-inch thick curtain that has been manipulated and fashioned by over 300 priests what it's simply saying here, there's no way that this could be done by human ingenuity or human power. This could only have been done by God from top to bottom. That it wasn't our own doing that made us access, that gave us access to God. Only God could have done it. In fact, what religion tells us, religion is, is, is not man's attempt, religion is man's attempt to God, but Christianity is God's attempt to man. In fact, I'll put it this way, religion is man's attempt to get access to God. However, Christianity is God's attempt to grant access to man. And so the curtain from top to bottom was torn. And it wasn't our own doing. It wasn't something that God looked and said, oh, you know what? You deserve this. We did not deserve this. And can I, can I, can I just remind us? In fact, in our postmodern society, the lie that I hear a lot is this lie of self-actualization. That it's somehow, if I can just be the better version of myself, then I can be my own functional savior. If somehow, if I can just uh, uh, get to the place to attain the best version of myself or, or the best me that I can be, then I can have access. Then I can rip the curtain from the bottom to the top. But can I just tell you that's a lie? We cannot do it on our own. You know how I know? Just think about this. Who is the only person in your life who has lied to you more, betrayed you more, and has failed you more? You know who that person in your life is? It's you, right? I have lied to myself more than I can think of, betrayed myself more than I, I promised that I'm never going to do it again, and I betrayed myself and failed myself, and yet that is the person that I'm going to look to to save me, to rip this curtain from bottom up, could only come from God. It, the reality, I, I do this a lot. I do a lot of self Evaluation. In fact, I do this in the new year. I always think about myself, what I'm going to be five years from now, ten years from now. But sometimes I'll kind of reverse that a little bit. And, and I would say, what would happen if I visited my ten-year younger version of myself? What would that interaction be, right? Because right, right, I'm, I'm sure, like I'm 36 right now. When I was 26, I probably thought at 36, I would be going places. That, that I would achieve something. That somehow I would get to the, the prime of my life. And I could almost imagine myself visiting my 26-year-old self, and I say, hey, this is me in 10 years. And my 26-year-old self is like, oh, that's what I got to deal with, right? You know, like, I thought you would have, like, a six-pack by now. Like, what's going on, right? And the reality is, it cannot be done from ourselves. So, the curtain is torn. There's a new access and path to God. God makes it a way where we can connect back to him. What do we do now? So write this as the last point. Point number four, here's what we do. We draw near. We draw near to God. In fact, Hebrews 10, the same verse that we read, it says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence that we don't have to enter into the holy of holies, the ark with, with fear and tremble. We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by this new and living way that he, Jesus, opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, here's what the writer of Hebrews' exhortation in the very next verse let us draw near. Let us go 
to God. Let us enter into the very presence of God. And I love what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4. The next verse, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firm to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with us. In other words, God knows. See, sympathy is simply saying, hey, I'm so sorry you're going through that. Empathy, on the other hand, says, I know what you're going through, and I can help you. So the writer of Hebrews says, we, are, we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But listen to this. But we have one who has been tempted in every way. Just look at the cross. Look what he bore for us just as we are. And yet he did not sin. And so let us approach God's throne. Let us draw near in light of what Jesus has done. Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Listen, what I love what he says here, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Anyone in need today? Is anyone in need is anyone carrying a load that they should not be carrying? Is anyone carrying guilt and shame? Is anyone going through hardships? Is anyone crying out to God in their time of need? The invitation of Jesus by the way of Jesus on the cross is that you can draw near. You can enter in with confidence, knowing that you're not going to be met with condemnation. You're not going to be met with, I told you so, look what you've done. But you, through Jesus who brings you to God, says that you, you can receive mercy and you can find grace in your time of need. So let us draw near to God. So with every head bowed and every eye closed at all of our campuses and online, would you do that? Would you do that? Would you enter? Maybe for you, you are carrying a load. Maybe for you, you are in the need of help because of Jesus. He has now granted us access to God. And the invitation of Jesus is that you can cast your burdens with confidence because God cares for you. So whatever it is that you're holding on to, would you cast it at the presence of God now that you have access to the throne of God through the blood and sacrifice of Jesus. And listen, with every head bowed and every eye closed, maybe for you, you're here today and you're listening to this message and you would say to yourself, that's great, I want that, but I do not have this access because I've never placed my faith and trust in the perfect work of Jesus. Maybe for you, you're the centurion of the story. That maybe for you, you are looking from a distance and you just realize in today's message that truly this is the Son of God. This is how I get access to God. This is how I draw near to God, is through the work of Jesus Christ. And listen, if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus, the, your reality is that sin still separates you. That when it comes to the presence of God, access is denied. But if you would cry out to God, trust in his sufficient sacrifice for your sins, the Bible says, access granted for the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so right where you are, if this is what you want, access with it, would you just simply pray this prayer? God, you from the beginning desire a relationship with me. But my sin separates me from you. But I know now that Jesus is the one who makes a way, who reopens a path to God for the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. I trust in that as my greatest hope. Allow me to enter in into your presence through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Well, listen, Christ Fellowship, can we give it up for those who pray that prayer at all of our campuses? And listen, if that's you, we would love to know that you made this decision. Simply go online at cfmiami.org slash connect and let us know about this decision that you have made. Christ Fellowship, I love you. God bless you. I'm going to invite the host to come in this moment. Go now in God's peace.